there's an interesting discussion taking place right now. Um, I guess one could broadly and somewhat clumsily describe it as uh, juxtaposition of um, emotions and intelligence, or um, the intellectual and the intuitive, or feelings versus thoughts, or whatever, you know, any of those two polarities. Um, and there are many other possible polarities here on this continuum, or I wouldn't even, wouldn't even call it a continuum, it seems to be more like a spider's web in shape, or you know, if one was to give it a diagram. It boils down to what are we, and what is our consciousness, and what does it do, and how does it function, and what's its ultimate nature. Um, well, I come at it in a, from a particular perspective. Um, I mentioned a lot that a long time ago, I suffered badly from depression, very badly debilitating depression. Um, and one of the worst things that I recall is you know, sitting, say, on the couch of my apartment, trying to put the pieces together as to what the hell was happening to me, um, trying to work it out in my mind, saying there's got to be a rational explanation for this. Um, something is happening. I was into, you know, I deliberately sought to explore my inner caverns and was into meditation and s stuff like that um, I wanted to I, I approached the whole thing very clinically I suppose um, now what exactly um, do I believe was going on at the time well speaking only for myself I finally more or less concluded that a big part of what was wrong with me was a disconnect between my feelings and my thoughts, my emotions and my mind, right? Uh, my mind would look around and say, okay, I've got a full-time job with good benefits and a kind of future to it. I've got a decent place to live. I have a girlfriend. I have, you know, um, whatever it is that overtly is supposed to make you feel good. I felt horrible. And this was overwhelming. This sense of insanity that all the externals are working fine and I still feel horrible. I still feel so bad that I can't get out of bed um, once a week or whatever. Literally can't get out of bed. Um, what do you do in a case like that when you're relying strictly on reason and, and, and intellect? You've, you've got nothing to go on here. Your tools are no longer useful. Um, sorry, the sun keeps darting behind clouds and coming out again, so you're going to get some weird lighting here. Nothing I can do about that. Um, and the way that I sort of slowly worked myself out of the depression was to reconcile this or to grasp that I'm a hell of a lot more than just a bunch of atoms and cells or whatever. Something is on the receiving end of enormous impressions of all of this, of what's happening. Um, people might call that value. Um, value, I assume, or I would say can only be expressed more or less uh, abstractly. You can't really come out and say, here's some value. Um, you have to sort of intuit your way towards it. And that's your less rational but no less vital uh, aspect. Um, I guess Freud versus Jung, right? Or, you know, what, what is the ultimate will here? Is the will to survive, the will to avoid suffering, the will to find meaning, the will to love, the will to life, the will to power, all this kind of thing. What is it that I want simply because it's in my nature to want? And what is it that I don't want simply because it's in my nature to have an aversion to it? That's not so easy to work out if you stick strictly to reason. Um, and you exclude things. Um, Ivla Day left a comment on Connor's video the other day saying you have to exclude all your feelings and rely strictly on reason. That, to me, strikes me as a very dangerous sort of thing, because if you try and cut out the feelings bit, 
they'll come in through the unconscious, right? That's Jung, I guess. Um, but, you know, it's it, it's simply another way of saying that you can't just ignore what you are, because it will follow you. You're trying to run from your own shadow, as it were. Um, running for, from one's shadow is a really fascinating um, motif for me, or image. Um, somebody is in a state of, of such inner conflict and ultimately such paralyzing anxiety, or perhaps not paralyzing anxiety, a sort of jittery anxiety, that the only thing that they can do is physically attempt to stay one step ahead of that which is dogging them, right? Uh, you get a good sense of that, and I, again, I'm not saying that I have an accurate reading of this, but you know, when you see somebody wandering or traipsing purposefully um, and constantly through the woods of rural New York State, um, as if driven to do so, you you can kind of form a picture of that in your mind. Someone whose inner demons are, or sorry, inner components are so conflicted that there's really nothing to do but run. Um, anyone who's ever had a severe panic attack or chronic anxiety knows that feeling that you constantly have to be in motion because you just believe that you're staying just one step ahead of existential panic I suppose. The existential panic in many ways is simply your feelings that you've trapped down there in a dungeon but it's still down there in that dark dungeon howling like the trapped beast that it is or growling and you hear it and it's not way far down in the dungeon it's right here um you know, Zapfi's existential panic. Um, I would like to refer anyone to Zapfi's de description of existential panic and ask, is that a rational process that, that uh, his caveman is undergoing when he has his moment of existential horror, uh, the, which kills him? I would say it's not rational. I'd say it's completely intuitive, but it does kill him, or it can at least wreck our minds. Our irrational can destroy our rational minds. Again, that not that anxiety and depression? Um, they have to kind of work in harmony. This has been my experience as opposed to at loggerheads with each other. And again, we go back to know thyself, right? Um, what am I? Well, again, Jung says we apprehend and store um, things, experiences, in two ways, rationally, uh, using our senses or our mental snapshot. Um, Connor just did a video on um, uh, eidetic memory, which is photographic memory, I guess, or sort of, not quite, um, which I use or I've developed, or maybe I'm just, I, I'm like that. But stored in eidetic memory would be impressions that you had of things, right? Um, the irrational, the feelings this sort of thing. You you can sort of, it's like reading poetry. Poetry is written in words, and words are supposed to just be, you know, strictly, it says what it says. But you're using words in such a way that they're not clinical. They're meant to invoke, deliberately designed to invoke emotion. Um, music, I guess, would work the same way. Um, now, I'm not trying to argue that these are two separate things, that the intellectual and the emotional or the intuitive versus the intellectual or whatever. They may simply be two components of ourselves, and they may, may not be the only ones, by the way. Um, two components of ourselves that conflict because they, at the very basic levels, they apprehend things in a completely different manner. One is a series of impressions, the other one is a series of categorizable facts or at least categorizable um, images to sort of talk about what Connor was talking about uh, eidetic memory um, the two can be separated to examine them but they may be part of the whole picture which is what memory is right so I don't know that intellectual and intuitive are the same thing, but I don't know that they're fully separate things either. They may simply be different aspects of the same overall thing. And sometimes it makes sense to talk about them as separate things, and sometimes it doesn't. 